It's the perfect autumn day. The aspens have turned a brilliant shade of yellow along the Provo River, and the weather is warm, with a hint of cooler temperatures on the horizon. DWR biologists and volunteers and waders begin entering the river and spread out with nets. A pontoon boat with a generator and a large metal box filled with water floats on the river in the middle of the crowd. The generator roars to life, and the group begins slowly moving their way upstream through the rocky water, with one man pulling the pontoon boat. Two men at the front of the group have long poles with nets at the end that are attached with cords to the generator. These special nets release electrical pulses through the water, which temporarily stun the fish. The fish are then scooped up by others downstream and placed into the metal box on the pontoon. We are literally using electricity to catch fish. And while it may not seem like it, this method of catching the fish doesn't harm them and helps provide valuable data about each species. This is WILD, a Utah Division of Wildlife Resources podcast. I'm your host, Faith Heaton Jolly, and this is episode 26, Electrofishing for Browns. Welcome back to WILD. I am here today along the lower Provo River. I don't know if you can quite make out the little river water sounds in the background. You can definitely make out the cars roaring down the highway (laughs) to the side of us. But I'm here with Mike Slater. He is the Central Region Sport Fish Project leader. And we've got to, anyway, have some have some fun today. We've I think so. Some electric yep. fishing, yeah. First of all, Mike, tell us how long have you been with the division and kind of what it is that you do for the division? Okay. I've been working with the Division of Wildlife now for about 24, 25 years. It doesn't seem like it's been that long, but it's say, been a lot of fun. That's a good while, yeah. <laughs> yep. It's hard to believe that I'm one of the guys that have been around a little while. Yeah, so. that's awesome. Yep. During that time, kind of walk us through kind of the different jobs that you've done. Yeah, out of school, I uh, went to school up in Logan and was able to start working as a sport fish biologist in Price down in the southeast region. And I was there about, a, what, five years and then had some opportunities in the central region and felt it was really good for me professionally to kind of branch out and do something a little bit different. Very, very similar job, but just different water. And sure. you learn things differently when you're working on different waters. That's cool. But now I guess I've been here in the Springville office or the central region for pushing 20 years. So just, it doesn't you, seem like it's stuck. been that long. Yeah, <laughs> Springville just sucked you right in. Yep. And... <laughs> kind of grew up in the area, grew up in Pleasant Grove. So it was kind of a, in a way, coming back home just a little bit too. And so it's been fun that way for, for family reasons. No, that's very yep. cool. And it's always fun to talk to people like yourself that are veterans, you know, at the division and have been here for such a long time and have such a breadth of knowledge because I'm the exact opposite. And so it's very apparent to our listeners that I am not a biologist. And so it's fun to talk to people that know all the things. On that note, walk us through kind of what we did today here. You know, we're doing some fall electrofishing surveys. So kind of explain to our listeners, what is electrofishing and basically kind of how it works? Electrofishing is a really, really effective way for us as biologists to get our hands on lots of fish, particularly in streams. Now, we probably do more in streams than we do in lakes for lots of different reasons. In streams, it gives us a chance to non-lethally sample the fish population. And what I like to do, especially here on the Provo River, since it demands, I think, a little extra attention from us as biologists just because of the use that, it's, that it gets. And so about every three to five years, we'll come back to the same locations that we've done some electrofishing in the past and look at trends. Do, are our numbers, fish numbers, going up? Are they going down? Is the health of the fish going up or down? Is it changing? Do we have different species even? So it really is a way for us to, over time, see what's happening. And electrofishing in general, or specifically, I guess I should say, we're using electricity in the water and the the tools that we're using it sends out little pulses if you will and these fish are kind of like a big muscle and every time that pulse gets emitted into that water the fish contracts and so as it does that it goes uncontrollably almost to those positive currents and it allows all of our volunteers our biologists to hurry and net those fish and put them in live wells where the fish can come to within a minute or so We're only sending out a little bit of electricity. We're not trying to kill these fish. Again, 
We're wanting to just sample them, get our hands on every fish possible in a particular reach of stream. And then when we're done with them, we put them right back into the stream and you or I or another angler can come and catch them later today yeah. or tomorrow. And it is kind of cool. So we are walking down and to kind of paint the picture. So you have like a pontoon that you're pulling down the stream and it has the generators on it and it kind of puts those electrical pulses in the water and it does almost like kind of stun the fish, right? So that it's easier to net them. Exactly, Faith. Yeah, it basically is just stunning the fish, allows us with our nets to hurry and get a hold of them and put them in those live wells. Otherwise, you're not gonna be able to sample these fish in right. the stream. You, you can kind of see them, but as you're walking up and down the stream, they're just darting all over the place. Totally. The electricity stuns them long enough for us to get our hands on them, and, and then we can process these fish and play with these fish just a little bit more. And even that, I was gonna say, I feel like it is kind of a skill that you acquire to even be able to net them once they're <laughs> stunned, because I was not good at it. I got really? a lot of sticks, but I feel like it is still a little bit challenging, because they are still moving, like you said. I mean, they're, they're still yeah, they're, very much alive. They're still and, alive, and yeah, yeah, they're wanting to get away. Yeah. You know? So we're trying to prevent that. For sure. Yeah. Um, One of the things that I've noticed when we're doing this is the fish, are, they're always closer to the bottom. And so us as volunteers and biologists, we're trying to net these fish. And you see the fish, it's right in front of you. So you'll stick your net down in, but we've always got to remember, wait, it's two more feet down. We've got to stick that net way down in there. I'm not going to see a fish in my net. Yeah, so, no, that totally yeah. makes sense. And so there, I know there's kind of a couple of different ways to do electrofishing. Mm -hmm. So this is the first time I've done one in kind of a smaller stream where you're pulling the pontoon kind of manually. I also was able to take a trip to the Green River two years ago and do some electrofishing surveys there and they were actually on a boat. So In a kind, boat, yeah. yeah. So kind yep. of talk about how those look different. Okay. The Provo River is one of the only places that within our region that we actually use the pontoon boat. It allows us to pull that pontoon that has a live well right on it, but it also gives me four charged nets, four positive nets, if you will, rather than a boat that's a little different, much bigger or a backpack. A lot of times we're in streams and we just have the thing right on our back and we're just oh. walking up through the stream. Maybe where but it's that's too even narrow. A, a smaller stream. I yes, see. much smaller. So here I've got four charge nets or in our case today on this a little bit smaller section of the, the Provo, we had three charged nets and it allows those guys or gals that are out there with the, the positive nets to boom, this is where we're gonna find the fish and they're gonna swim right towards those charged nets. Cause it kind of draws them in like It kind of draws them in, yep, draws them right in and then we can pass those fish back. But, but the pontoon's just kind of a, a step in between the backpack shocking or the boat shocking that you see on the Green River. So with this, you know, one question that always comes up is, you know, is this safe for people too? We certainly have to be careful, you know, electricity and water doesn't mix real well. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and so, so there's some cautions, you know, we wear some gloves on occasion, or we just try not to get our hands in the water or touch those metal nets, if you will. And so long as we can kind of stay away from that, we're safe, we're doing it, and, and we're going to get the data that we need. Very safe. And like I say, we've had volunteers, we have multiple guides, fishing guides, and other organizations here with us today. And so it's, it's not rocket science, it's just a, a systematic way that we can get in there and we can get our hands on these fish in a very safe manner too. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. I was going to say, I like all of us that were doing it, we're also wearing like rubber boots and waders. So I feel like there is kind of that layer of protection. Mm -hmm, and I, sure. I was close to the pontoon and the electrical stuff and never Didn't get hurt anything. or anything? Yeah, yeah if, if I was to get in my Tevas and jump out there and do it, yeah, I'd, I'd feel it and my <laughs> knees would buckle and gotcha. I'd, I'd want to change my, my methods, yeah. Gotcha. With this whole process, you know, we, we've kind of touched on electrofishing. What are some of the other methods that we also use to try and get some of this information about fish populations in an area? Maybe I'll look at lakes. Lakes are very different. Um, it's more of a passive sampling technique that we use, and it's using nets. We'll set nets overnight, and we're hoping that the fish are gonna come and swim and get tangled in our nets. And so that's very different than what we're doing is working right up through the rivers, trying to find the fish ourselves and then zap them, if you will, and pull them towards us. So another technique is gill netting, we call okay. it. And that's a very effective way, but it's also done for different reasons. Typically those fish that we catch in our gill nets are going to die. And mm -hmm. so we're looking for different information. We're looking at the insides of the fish. We're looking at what have they been eating um, and some of those kinds of things. Gotcha. So 
So it's just very different, but it's another way for us to get our hands on fish. And one thing I like to remind the public about is, is sometimes we do sacrifice fish, but the numbers that we sacrifice are so minimal when you're looking at a population of tens of thousands of fish. If we sacrifice, you know, 20 fish, I think that data is well worth it. But here in this case, it's the best of both worlds. We can do it non-lethally, and we get a lot of that information in another way. Yeah, that's awesome. So. You kind of mentioned with these surveys that we do each year, we're looking at, you know, the populations, how many fish there are, the different species there are, you know, how big they are. Kind of talk about and explain as far as like a fish management standpoint, how do we use that data to help? Like what types of decisions are we making okay. from that information? I kind of alluded to trends earlier, maybe. And that's something that we really like to look at is how many fish do we have per mile? For example, on the Lower Provo in 2017, which is the last time we did these surveys, we had between 2,300 and 3,700 fish per mile. Now we're going to look and we're going to count these fish and we're going to try and extrapolate and say, okay, how many do we have today? Do we have 23 to 3,700 or are there more fish or are there less fish? And then we'll look at the, we'll sit at the desk and say, okay, what should we have in a river like this and compare it to other waters, other states even. How does this compare to these other places? And that will then help us, you know, we're too low or we're too high or maybe we're just right. And, and we'll make decisions such as, do we need to change regulations? Do we need to encourage people to harvest more fish or less fish? Those are some of the management decisions that we as biologists then get to suggest or make and, and on a statewide basis with lots of others' input, we'll make those kinds of decisions if there are any to be made. I see. And I'd been talking to some of the other biologists today, um, and I didn't realize this, so they were saying with at least this particular area, the lower Provo River, we don't stock here, but I guess this can also guide like where to stock fish and how many fish to stock, right? Absolutely. If we felt like, God, you know, we just don't have enough fish here and the habitat characteristics tell us that, you know, you could have a whole lot more fish. Do we look at stocking fish? Um, but in our case and with the data that we've collected over the years, we really haven't decided that we need to stock more fish. In fact, I think we have plenty of fish in the Provo River. And I think the last time we stocked any fish in the Provo was probably back in the early 70s. Oh, wow. And so it's been that long and the fish have been able to hold their own, They're you know, reproduce good. and do their, their own thing. I think in the early 2000s, we had a period where we tried to stock some cutthroat. And that was more of a, hey, for a unique opportunity. But we kind of went back on that and felt like, you know, we have enough fish here. It's probably not the best thing to put more fish in on top of what was already there. Gotcha. But all this data that we're collecting, those are the kinds of decisions that we get to make and, and try and recommend. And the anglers, they're a part of this as well. We meet with anglers on a regular basis and we try and get a handle on what do you want? What are you seeing from an angler's perspective? And we kind of meld that with the, the biological data that we're collecting on days like today. Yeah. And then make a decision together. That's awesome. Um, and so kind of going into this particular area, so with this, with the lower Provo River, you know, you'd mentioned this is a very popular fishing spot, right? Like there's a ton, a ton of anglers that come um, and it's great. And so you have done surveys, basically, this is your fourth day of this whole week, just basically doing different sections of the river. So kind of go into what you're seeing for this specific river, um, kind of what type of fish have we been catching and okay. how it compares to maybe last year or the last time we surveyed this area. Okay, yeah. Um, again, the fourth day of surveying in different types of habitats and, and reaches on the lower Provo. Um, this is a little bit smaller section of river or narrower or less flows, less water compared to what we've seen upstream. Um, and so that's going to change a little bit. We're not going to count as many fish here today as we did yesterday. Yesterday we probably handled 1,200, 1,300 fish oh, literally wow. in a 600 foot stretch of stream. Wow. Here, you know, I'm just guessing we might have seven or 800 fish. Still a lot of fish in 500 feet of stream. Yeah. Plenty for anglers to come and catch. Um, but it's just a little bit different and something that's unique about this 
lower section right at the mouth of Provo Canyon is at certain times of the year we were made aware of this you know probably three four years ago from some anglers saying hey there's no water what's going on are the, the fish are stressing they're gonna die what what can we do about it so we all kind of sat around and got to the table and said what's really happening and we were um, made aware of some different things and different water uses and needs that were being met legally and everything and it's like hmm how do we how do we function within this scenario and it was determined that we need to try and see if we can't get our hands on a little more water that can flow down the river without impacting anybody else's water rights or anything like that just to and, help keep fish yeah alive. just to help keep the fish alive right. because anglers got used to catching fish here and fishing here while a power plant right at the mouth of the canyon was kind of being renovated, if you will. Well, while they were renovating it, they obviously weren't generating power and weren't pulling water out of the river to generate that power. Sure. So we thought, well, is there a way to kind of meet both needs, continue to generate that power, but yet still have a little bit of water in the river? And so with multiple partners, and maybe I could mention a few of those, with Trout Unlimited, uh, the River, the Mitigation Commission, Central Utah Water Conservancy District, some non-typical players like Facebook, Coca-Cola, then obviously the Division of Wildlife and others, we all kind of got together and said, hey, you know, let's put some money together and let's pay for some of the interference costs since they're not going to be able to generate that power because we're going to leave that little bit of water in the stream, can we pay for that? Pay for that, we call it, again, interference costs. And, and it worked out. It's worked out for maybe the next 10 years. We've spent about a million dollars between all these different groups and partners to allow about 20 CFS. Not a lot of water, but it's enough to maintain that fish population, the frog population, all the other things that go with right. water and and we're going to leave that in the stream for those really hot dry spells during the late summer and, and then so. i th about saying with this project i remember hearing because i think it happened last year's yes you said. correct mm -hmm. um i think it's super cool to see just all the different partnerships and groups that come together to make it work because i mean like you said the non-typical i mean other groups it's like whoa where did yeah. they come from yes this is awesome but it's know? cool and it's just to me is another demonstration that people are passionate about wildlife and they want to take care of the wildlife and so when they see issues like oh the river's dry like that is kind of a red flag and it can have impacts to yep. our species and our ecosystem and so it's cool to see people kind of pool together to overcome some of those some yeah. of those issues no nobody was pointing fingers or anything like that it was right. just like hey what's the solution how can we meet everybody's needs and still maintain a fishery totally which is one of the needs that totally. we have that we feel as well yeah oh. it's been really really neat a win-win that's I awesome think. um and with um this these types of surveys how often are we typically doing these and why like are there specific reasons that we do it in the fall you know or kind of yeah. what goes into the time of year that we're going to do these okay a place like the Provo River because of the demand that's associated with it from anglers and recreationists and everybody in between we typically will come here about every three to five years at a particular location to look at that trend to see if things are changing and just to get a handle on it for example other streams there's no way we could spend that much time and sample every river or every creek or every lake that. within the central region mm -hmm. or this geographical area. It's just too demanding. Right. But the Provo River, we have six, 7,000 anglers per mile every year fishing this. Wow. That's a lot of pressure. That's and a that's lot a of lot people. of angler dollars too. We've done some studies and there's been some calculations. It's about $300,000 per mile is spent on the lower Provo River. Wow. And so that's one of the reasons that we spend a little extra time doing these exact kind of surveys is to say, hey, it demands our attention and we're gonna make sure that we do these surveys and follow that trend to make sure that we don't get caught off guard waiting for 10 years and all of a sudden, oh, hey, wait a minute, the fish are all gone or sure. they're not healthy or we need to hurry and do something about it when it might be a little bit too late gotcha. to, to make some changes. And, and so is that kind of, I guess, like you'd mentioned, we try to kind of mix it up and 
where we're doing surveys and which water bodies or streams or whatever. Mm -hmm. But is that part of it? We, we try to prioritize the ones that we know are, are very popular. Absolutely. Yeah. There's, there's certain waters where it just demands our attention. Reservoirs, strawberry reservoir. We've got some biologists dedicated to just function literally just on that water body to make sure that things are clicking, things are working. Same thing with the Prola River, the Green River, where you mentioned earlier. There's just some waters that just, hey, we need to make sure that we don't let things slip away without us recognizing it in gotcha. time. And I know with these types of, you know, electrofishing surveys or gill netting surveys, we do them typically kind of spring and fall. Is there a reason that we do them those particular times of year? There is. We like to be as consist consistent as possible um, because fish do certain things at different times of the year. And if we sample one year in July and then the next year we do it in October, just the, the habits of the fish may totally change our data, change the numbers. Here in particular on the lower Provo River, during the middle of the summer, we've got two and 300 CFS flowing down the river. You got to walk in the river here today, we might have 30 CFS, 40 CFS. And, and it still, was hard. It still felt like it, it was, was hard tough, to walk. Huh? <laughs> and so for over. us to be able to try and come in in the middle of the summer when we've got that much flow, it's just impossible. It's just not practical for us to be able to get any good data, but then safety. I mean, sure. there's, we're, we're gonna be tripping and falling and getting shocked and sure. everything else. <laughs> sure. So so that's one of the reasons the irrigation season typically ends about the first part of October, mid-October. And so we, we try and get in as soon after that as we can. And it's just prior to the brown trout spawning and we don't want to interrupt that either. So there's a really narrow window, window on the Provo River when we get to come in and do our sampling. I see. Okay, that so, does make a lot of sense. Yep. Um, so. And you'd mentioned brown trout. What specifically are kind of the main fish species that we see in this, in yeah, this area? Yeah, good question. It is primarily a brown trout fishery. Um, historically, I bet 80% of the fish that we saw or we typically will see will be brown trout. Okay. In addition to that, depending on what stretch of the lower Provo River we're sampling, we'll see a lot of whitefish. Um, we'll see rainbow trout. Um, we'll see lots of sculpin. A lot of people don't even know what that is. It's just a little tiny bottom feeding fish. And to me, it looks really archaic. It just looks like it come from the dinosaur ages. Yeah. It is a really different fish, but it's a really important part of the ecosystem as well. In fact, it provides a lot of food for those brown trout or for those rainbow trout. Oh, I see. So, Because so they never get very big, I guess. The biggest ones will be maybe four inches long. Oh, okay. that, that's a really big sculpin. Okay. Yep. Interesting. So, so those are the main species that we see. And that's what we got to see today. I think we saw all of those species yeah. while uh, we were sampling. Yeah. It's kind of cool. Um, and it is fun to yeah see them up close and something you know, different. Yeah. Kind yep. of interesting. Yeah. Um, so we've obviously talked a, a lot about, you know, fish management, some of the methods we use to collect data about fish and help guide our decisions. What are some things that you wish as, you know, you've been doing this for decades. What are some things that you wish people understood about fish management or maybe misconceptions that people might have? Yeah. Um, one of the things that I think is really important for us to understand is, is nature kind of does its own thing. You know, we as biologists, absolutely. We're here, we're tinkering, tinkering with things and trying to tweak things here and there. But for the most part, if we provide the necessary habitat and the very basic essentials, water, the habitat, and the food that comes along with that, the fish for the most part will do their thing. But if we decide, you know, hey, we don't, we need to use the water for this or without really talking or communicating with, with partners and agencies and, and stuff together, some of those things fall out of the mix, you know. Fish aren't going to do well without water. We came up with a solution here in this particular situation that, you know, that was awesome because it was the anglers that brought it to our attention and we found a solution. And so we as biologists, we do a little bit more than drive around in our, our brown or silver trucks. <laughs> you know, we get our feet wet, we, we get dirty. Literally. And, and we are. We're, we're in, in the details of how can we make this better. And it's not for us, it's for the public. This is the public's resource. And that's really what we are trying to do is be good stewards of their resources. Lots of public want fish to either catch 
or maybe they just want to know that they're there. Both are legitimate reasons for us as biologists to be doing our work and, and trying to, to make it work, to make it happen, and to keep things healthy, if you will. Yeah, for sure. So, I like that. We're kind mm-hmm. of, we're mentioned as like we're stewards, you know, but yeah, yeah. We're, we're working with nature, hopefully, you know, we're trying to, anyway, to, to make things Just better. to kind of keep things going in the right direction yeah. as much as anything. For yep. sure. Um, and lastly, since you have been here for so long, you have so much experience, I wanted to kind of ask if you can think of kind of a favorite experience that you've had doing some of these surveys or if there's kind of a, yeah, a favorite memory that comes to mind or or kind of what's, what's your favorite part of all of this? You know, some of the things that I've really enjoyed about my work is the interaction that I have with people that are just as passionate about fish in this case as I am. Some of the people that we saw today, they fish this river 10 times as much as I will get to fish it because that's what they do. You know, they work as fishing guides or whatever it might be. And so that's some of my favorite memories is being able to do surveys like this, getting our feet wet together with those whom we're trying to work for, and to be able to see the kind of fish that we're seeing. I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm weird, but I get pretty excited when I see a three, four pound fish that we get to electrocute and we get it in the net. It's not quite as good when it's on the end of my fly rod, but <laughs> but it, it's fun, you know, and it's exciting. And and I, I think, was about to say that's I'm not a good angler, so that's uh-huh. the closest I'm ever going to get to one. So I definitely so took a selfie with yeah. one. I'm like, this is the only time I'm holding a fish right. this big. <laughs> we're catching a lot of fish, you know, and, and instead of just fishing, we're actually catching, and this is so incredibly effective. I mean, I might fish through this 500 foot stretch, and I might catch three or four fish. And am I going to call the division and say, God, there's no fish in the Provo River? I'm not, because I get the experience of electrofishing and say, actually, there was about 700 fish in that stretch. You only caught three of them. Right. And so that's just such an eye opener for me. And that's kind of something that I enjoy seeing. And one of the things, you know, with this electrofishing, it's like I have a hard time when people call me and say, hey, you know what? There's no fish. And I'll look into it, absolutely, and take that say, you know, let's look into it. Let's see what's really there. And maybe electricity kind of helps both me and the anglers understand that. And so those are some of my favorite memories, I guess, is being able to help people understand and see what I'm seeing in the river. But I want to see what they're seeing, too. Say, hey, what are you catching? How has the fishing been? Because I learn just as much from that side and hearing from them as I do, or maybe they do and me sharing what we're doing totally yeah it was funny one of the people that i think it maybe was a fishing guide or something that was coming and volunteering with us today and i was kind of talking to him and he was making the joke of that yeah like (laughs) i've fished here a million times and i've never caught like i haven't caught anything for a minute and now i know they're there so he's like yeah, it humbles us. Funny. It humbles yeah. us a lot. It's like, oh, I thought I was a really good angler. Right. Maybe, maybe I'm not as good as I thought. I'm, right. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's no. awesome. No. Well, awesome. Well, thanks for taking a minute to kind of explain, you know, some of this work that you guys do. I know that it's it it is a lot of work and it takes a lot of planning and coordination. And so, anyway, I think it's I think it's awesome, and I think it's cool for our listeners to hear mm-hmm. the the work that does go into this and the passion and how we use that data so yep. yeah thanks for it, t- it it's fun it. and, and i kind of get i feel guilty because i call it play i mean i am absolutely out here playing but as you saw today you know we start sweating and we get tired it's, it's and hard work i'm ready to be done you yeah know, i'm gonna go deer hunting this weekend i'm ready to get out of the water and, and take a break from what we've been yep. doing you've so. had a long week for <laughs> sure um well as always if you haven't yet we'd love if you could subscribe to the wild podcast we release a new episode on the third tuesday of each month and so we hope that you'll join us next month for some more wildlife stories 